Hi everybody and you're very welcome to this next episode of the series of Father Shane Sullivan. Just a quick reminder, during the course of this episode, at times Father Shane may refer to handouts or to questions that people are, being, are asking him. The reason he does this is that this these episodes were recorded primarily for a prayer group that Father Shane runs in the Archdiocese of the Tune, and he's been running this prayer group over Zoom. And because of that, members of the prayer group have been they've been given a handout and they've also asking questions so just in case you're wondering what he's referring to there that that's that's essentially what it is but don't worry you're not missing out you can still follow the whole episode and the whole series uh clearly you're not going to be lost and look i I really really hope you enjoy it god bless excellent so welcome everybody to our third session for an introduction to prayer uh, today we're going to talk about the second of the three stages of the spiritual life, which is called the illuminative way. So we'll begin together in the name of the Pro- Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and kindle within us the fire of thy love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of thy faithful Grant by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are on to the second stage of the spiritual life now. It's called the illuminative way. Illuminative way. And uh, the main work that happens here, if you remember from kind of our introduction, was Uh, our transformation. That's what happens during this stage primarily of the spiritual life. Our transformation. This is maybe a a tidy way to summarize it. In the illuminative way, we learn to love Christ. Uh, To love Christ more, I should say. We learn to love Christ more and to become more like him. So after the kind of purification of the first stage of the spiritual life, where we've made progress in detaching from mortal sin and detaching also from the deliberate venial sins, God leads us into the illuminative way, right? But before we actually get to the, the, that stage itself, uh, I just want to explain the transition from the purgative way to the illuminative way. So there's an image that the saints like to use saints like St. Catherine of Siena, which help us to understand the way that we go from one stage to the other. And the the image that she uses and that other saints use as well is the lives of the apostles. Okay. The lives of the apostles. Think about the apostles. They change, they grow, they throughout their lives, they are converted to become, to come closer to Christ. And you can see where they live those three stages and also where they begin them. Right again, in the lives of the apostles from the gospels. So first, the purgative way, where do they enter into the, this first stage of the spiritual life? When Jesus calls them in Galilee, when they drop their nets and then they follow him, they leave behind their previous way of life. And now they live, they set off to live in friendship with God, to live the life of grace. So that's the first stage of the spiritual life. And it happens there when Christ calls them. The purgative way again begins for us when we make that initial conversion, experiencing God's mercy and uh, breaking from sin and then beginning to live the life of grace, even though we might fight against, you know, the the inclinations to sin and we might fight against sin and stumble and fall. Um, It begins there. Okay. What about the illuminative way? The second, uh, the second kind of transition that they make. When do they make that leap? When they experience the depths of their own weakness, when they abandon Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, they experience the depths of their own weakness, number one, and they also experience terrible sorrow for their, the the high regard they still have for themselves. Their self-love is what we call it. And they come to then afterwards to love Jesus for his own sake. 
and not just for what he gives them. This is key of the illuminative way. We'll talk about those two things in a minute. Then when do they take the next step, so to speak? The first one is coming to follow Christ when he calls them and they drop their nets. The second way is begins when they, they really face their, the depths of their own poverty, their need, profound need for God, that they can't do it on their own. And secondly, their, the love that they still have for themselves. They make the third sort of leap into the third uh, stage of the spiritual life, the unitive way at Pentecost, when they receive the Holy Spirit, God's own spirit. But we'll talk about that more next week. Okay. So God leads the apostles into the illuminative way by letting them see their own weakness and letting them see how their love is still so self-serving. This is exactly how he brings us into the illuminative way as well. He leads us into it by letting us experience our own poverty. In other words, how profoundly we need God. Okay. And he allows us to see that without him, we can do nothing and we are nothing. I'm going to say that again. He allows us to see that without, without him, we are nothing and we can do nothing. Just like St. Peter and the apostles. He also lets us see how mixed our motives are. How mixed into our love of God is the love that we have for ourselves, just like the apostles. This process, as you can imagine, is very humbling and it's quite painful. So let's break down both of those things that God does. First, in the transition from the illuminative way, God lets us see just how much self-love is mixed our love for him. So we love God with what the saints have called a mercenary heart. It's a great kind of line, you know, great thing if you wanted to, to write down. Um, we love God with, at the beginning, what the saints call a mercenary heart. Do we love God? Yeah, absolutely. We love God. But without being conscious of it, we also serve God with self-interest. We love God, but to a great extent, we love him for, as St. Catherine says, our own profit, our satisfaction, or the pleasure that we find in him. We love God, in other words, not for who he is, but for often what he gives us. This means that our love is weak. When we're deprived of consolations, the good feelings that God gives us, our love often fails. It can't last. Again, just like the apostles in Gethsemane. Think of St. Peter, right? When the moment came, that moment when he was, his love for Christ was really put to the test. This is how St. Catherine of Siena describes it. Not only did Peter not have the strength to suffer for him, but at the first sign or the first threat of danger, his loyalty was overcome by the most servile fear. And he denied him three times, swearing that he did not know him. This weakness of St. Peter's love was exposed. It was made obvious, especially to Peter. God helps us in this transition into the illuminative way. God helps to show us our own mercenary hearts and how weak our love for him is. Don't worry though, right? Because in the illuminative way, he's going to help our love to grow stronger. Okay. Now, the second thing that happens again that God shows us is that God shows us um, how much we need him. How does he do that? He lets us experience our letting him down. He lets us, experiencing, he lets us experience this by letting us abandon him, leave him, sin against him, betray him. We have to experience the depths of our poverty how much we need God so we don't have this false image of ourselves so that we don't think that we're sort of, I don't know, towers of strength. We have to know how much we need God. And in order for us to really learn this, 
God allows us to stumble and fall. He doesn't do this out of badness. He does this as part of this process by which he is purifying us and he's, he's making us holy. God often, and I'm sure that many of you can relate to this, God allows us to experience some fault that we have. Maybe it's a sin that you continue to struggle with and you bring to confession over and over and over again. And, you know, you find yourself brought to your knees by it. God, is, God allows us to experience these things in order to humble us. In that way, we can take a true measure of ourselves. The great spiritual writer, Gary Lagrange says, by kind of facing our own weakness, we take a true measure of ourselves. We see, we see where we're really at. God allows us to see that without him, again, we're nothing and we can do nothing. And what's the result of that? The result of that is that our, our hearts are moved to sorrow. Think of that great scene. It's from St. Luke's gospel, right? Chapter 22, verses 54 through 62. Okay? That's Luke 22, verses 54 through 62, where Peter denies Jesus in the courtyard. And he denies him to the servant girl. They're all around that fire. Do you remember? And Peter denies Jesus three times. And at the end of it, there's this line. And it's so poignant. Jesus looks at Peter. Jesus sees Peter and they like lock eyes. And what happens? It breaks Peter. Peter faces Jesus whom he has just denied that he even knew him. When we love God, even as weakly as we do, when we sin, when we betray him, when we let him down and we, we, we stumble and fall, what happens? Our soul weeps for sin. We're moved to sorrow and we experience God's mercy. That's not new. That's something that we've experienced from the very beginning of our spiritual life, right? You, we sin, we're moved uh, to sadness for our sin for some reason or another, either because we're afraid of punishment, especially at the beginning, but increasingly because we really love God and we're really sorry for doing anything that would offend him. And then we experience God's mercy. That's nothing new. But here's the new thing. Here's what's new that happens in this transition into the illuminative way. God pulls back. God withdraws. Let me explain. God doesn't withdraw his mercy. We still receive his mercy. But now God withdraws the feeling of consolation. The sort of, the feelings that we get uh, and that we have often been too attached to, that we've loved too much, that we've become dependent on. God St. Catherine explains it. She says, in order to cause the soul to seek God without a lively faith and a hatred for its own sensuality. God pulls those things away so that we would love God and not the good feelings that God gives us. Make sense? So in, the, in this transition, right, into the illuminative way, God pulls back some of those uh, lovely feelings, the consolations that we experienced in the first part of our spiritual life. You could call it almost like a honeymoon period, right? God pulls those things back, right? The withdrawal of those sensible consolations is called the dark night of the senses. You guys have heard of probably the dark night of the soul, right? Yeah. Well, the dark night of the senses is the transition from the purgative way into the illuminative way. The dark night of the soul is the transition from the illuminative way into the unitive way. And we're going to talk about that next week, okay? But the dark night of the senses is what we're talking about here, where we our hearts are broken because we've, we've experienced our own kind of the weakness of our own love and our own poverty, how, how 
weak our own commitment to God is. And we've come to God in his mercy and God has given us his mercy, but he pulls him his, those good feelings back so that we would love God more. We would press on and love him even when we don't feel like loving him or it doesn't feel good to love him. Okay. He wants us to love him for his own sake. That's what the maturing is that's happening here. And not for any consolations or good feelings or other blessings even that God gives us. Okay. So God's work is, you could maybe say, our emptying of ourselves. God is emptying us. Why? He's emptying us of our, of our pride and our self-centered reasons we had for loving him so that he can, we can be filled with him. In this stage, we don't maybe experience those consolations, the same kind of consolations we experienced at the first stage of our spiritual lives, but don't worry, right? God doesn't leave us totally bereft. Um, what does God do? God gives us greater lights is how the spiritual writers describe it. In other words, a greater understanding of himself during this stage of the illuminative way. He gives us greater fruitfulness in our apostolic work. We become far more effective apostles. He gives us a more intense desire for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. All these things God builds within us and kind of blesses us with during this time. It might result in us feeling maybe the the tremendous overwhelming peace or, you know, uh, the, the sensible joy or whatever, those things may, may still come in fact, but it, they might not be as intense or as, as frequent, but God still does like very much bless the soul. It's just the consolations are, are different and he helps us to pray better as well during this stage. So the illuminative way again is like our learning to love Jesus like we haven't before. We learn to love Jesus for who he is and not for what he gives us. And the way that it kind of is practically evident, we learn to love Jesus by meditating on his life. We give our attention to his virtues, to the sentiments of his own heart, of his actions, of his priorities, of the words that he spoke in his own and his, and his actions, as I say. And we learn how to rely on him more and his grace. So that's kind of the practical way of um, how we love him more and love him like we haven't yet. Um, we focus more in this time on the life of Jesus and on what makes him who he is. And then we learn how to rely on him more. And we make it our aim to become to be more like him. Okay. So now we get to the prayer bit. Okay. Um, the prayer is very much tied into all of that. It, the prayer helps that work of God actually take place. So you remember that in the last time we talked about the beginnings of mental prayer, right? And Last week, we talked about this type of prayer called discursive prayer. And the one thing that, that's good to maybe remember at this point about discursive prayer is that its main, emphasis is, its main emphasis is on the considerations, on kind of our intellect, on taking the truths of faith and pondering them and sort of like uh, letting them grow, uh, us grow stronger in our conviction of them, letting them kind of challenge us and really we live by these truths of faith. But it's kind of like, we, we're, um, it's considerations. That's the main emphasis here. As that matures, as you come into the illuminative way, right, it changes. And you begin what's called effective prayer, as in not effective, but affective, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E, -E, effective prayer. The This type of prayer, effective prayer, the main emphasis is on moves from the intellect to the will, okay? And effective prayer, the main emphasis is on what's called the, what are called the acts of the will. Now you might be asking like, okay, what are the acts of the will? Well, here's some examples. 
The acts of the will are to worship God, to praise him, to thank him, to offer to the Lord, Jesus, the tenderest sentiments of love. I'm quoting here um, from some of the great spiritual writers. Also, another, these acts of the will don't just include God. They also include, let's say, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we express like a childlike, trustful, unselfish love in her. Trust in the saints. Other sentiments, other acts of the will that can, that can happen during these prayers are things like shame and confusion or humiliation for our sin where we kind of turn towards God almost in desperation and are expressing this, these acts of the will. Otherwise, another one might be ardent desires to improve and to become better. Another act of the will is, and you'll see where this comes into the meditations that I'm going to give to you now, is uh, our petitions to God so that we can be, become more like him. We can become more like Christ. We're disciples. We're followers of Jesus. We want to become more like him. An act of the will is like an expression of our desire. Lord, please make me more like the Lord in his gentleness or in his patience or in his courage or any of those ways, any of those attributes of Jesus. So petitions to God. Now, the methods of this meditation, this way of mental prayer called effective prayer, there's lots of different methods, right? And you'll see that, I mean, there's a lot of overlap between this discursive prayer and the effective prayer. It's just the emphasis that's quite different. The considerations for the discursive prayer and then the acts of the will for the affective prayer. So it becomes more like speaking to God as opposed to thinking about God. Does that make sense? Okay. Discursive prayer is more like pondering meditating. And there is an element of talking to God then about it, but that becomes more prominent in effective prayer in the illuminative way. Okay. Right. Okay. So I'm going to move to the method of meditation. So I sent to you guys in the email, I sent you all a, a way of meditating on the scriptures. So look, if our main focus in the illuminative way is to be transformed more. And what that means is to come to love Christ more and to become more like him. Where is the place that we're naturally going to go? The gospels. We're going to go to the Bible, right? So this is a way to meditate effective prayer, effective prayer, right? Um, this type of mental prayer using the Bible. Okay. That's what I've, I've sent to all of you here. Now this isn't, you'll be glad to know this isn't me. I'm not, I didn't come up with this, right? If I came up with this, you should run a mile, all right? This is not from me. This is from um, a group of priests called the Sulpicians, right? And the Sulpicians were a group of, group of priests, and they were especially dedicated to the formation of diocesan priests. Um, but they're really great. One of the things that's so great about them is they're very practical, and they're also very um, realistic, right? So they know that diocesan priests don't, aren't like monks, we don't have hours and hours to spend in prayer every day. We have to pack a lot into a little bit of time, which I'm sure the same thing is true for you. <laughs> You're lay people. You've got a million different responsibilities, right? So this is a way of meditating. It looks quite long, but you'll see when you kind of get into the habit of it, it actually, you, you naturally enough move from thing to thing, basically. Okay. So I'm just going to briefly go through this. I'm not going to go through it extensively. I've written it out in a way that I think will be obvious to you. I think it will kind of make sense as you go through it. Um, but as you, as you look at it with me, hopefully you're able to look at it now. If there's any questions that you have, just put them up in the text, in the chat thing. Okay. The chat feature. All right. So the first thing is uh, in this Catholic way of Catholic meditation on the scripture, it's effective prayer is preparation, right? The best meditation happens only with good preparation, right? It's like painting your house. If any of you have ever painted before, one of the most important things to do is to prepare well. You got to lay down the sort of uh, drop cloths. You got to tape everything. 
Otherwise, everything takes longer and it gets sloppy, right? So good preparation is uh, goes a long way to making your meditation um, all that it could be. So there are three types of, or of preparation that are described here. Remote preparation, this is sort of just stuff that should be built into your day, right? Just kind of the normal way that you live your life. I mean, it's kind of obvious stuff, like you're trying to grow in an awareness of the presence of God throughout your life, throughout your day, rather. Uh, trying to protect your senses from what allures it. So like trying to watch, like, what sort of stuff am I watching on TV or on Netflix? What sort of stuff am I listening to? All of that stuff will affect your meditation, right? If you're taking in a whole bunch of garbage, right? When you finally take, you know, your 20 minutes and you sit down and pray, you're going to be affected by that. It's not like you're able just to compartmentalize totally, you know, you have to watch the sort of stuff you're, you're ingesting, the stuff you're taking in. And then uh, kind of uh, developing more of a, a, a recognition of the gifts that you've been given by God and putting those to the service of other people. All of these things are part of that remote preparation. Then you've got proximate preparation, a little bit more practical, okay? So you first look at what passage of the Bible am I going to actually be reading and meditating on? And uh, as I write there, you know, I would recommend, you could do this with any part of the Bible, but easiest to begin with the Gospels, right? With the, the life of Jesus himself. So you pick a, a little passage from, the, from the, the Gospels. Pick something small. Don't pick a whole chapter. If you pick a whole chapter, it's just, you're not going to be able to actually sit down and focus on a few attributes of Jesus. You'll see now in a minute. Pick something small, like, a, like an episode, right? That some instance in Jesus' life. Some, you know, time where some person that he met, a cure that he, that he, a miracle that he worked, you know, uh, one of his, his teachings, a parable, you know, you're looking at a small chunk, right? Read through it once, aloud if possible, right? Uh, and then take notice of like the different action words that you see. What is Jesus saying? What are the other people saying or doing? Um, and you'll see why we do that in a, in a moment, all right? And then maybe there's something you want to take note of that you want to focus on, especially the next day when you're actually doing the meditation. This isn't always possible for people. Again, people are living very busy lives, but this is ideal. You know, if you can read it beforehand, this, to be honest, personally, very rarely happens for me. But if I'm really on my A game, I can read it beforehand the night before and the next day be ready to go when I'm actually doing the meditation. It's not the first time I, I've sat down to read it. Then you've got the immediate preparation. This is what happens right before you actually sit down to do the meditation. You call to mind that you're in the presence of God. And again, we are uh, flesh and blood. We're, we're body as well as spirit. So we have to, we involve our body in our prayer. So we bless ourselves or we kneel down or we make a profound bow. We acknowledge that we're in the presence of God physically, as well as calling to mind that we're in God's presence. Then we ask God's forgiveness and we ask for his help and asking the Holy Spirit to enlighten us as we begin. Now, become happens the actual meditation. So again, I'm not going to go through the, in an exhaustive way. There are three parts to the meditation. Christ before my eyes, Christ in my heart, and Christ in my hands. And you'll see why those are, they're called those now. Christ before my eyes. This is the first move of the meditation. You're reading the passage from scripture and you're trying to pay attention to what can you see Jesus being like or Our Lady being like or St. Peter or one of the saints being like or some figure. What are they like? You're trying to identify different attributes, right? So you can see, for instance, in the story of uh you know, Jesus with the woman caught in adultery. You can see Jesus's courage. He doesn't care what other people think about him. You can see the mercy of Jesus in the way that he looks at that woman. You can see in that woman a total shock at the mercy shown to her by God. And you can see before that kind of maybe a beaten down and a, this is a woman who's been wrung out by life, okay? 
So the first move is to kind of recognize, okay, what, what can I see about these figures? It's helpful to notice like the action words. What is Jesus saying? What is she saying? What are they doing? What's happening? These are just helpful ways to kind of get into it where you're, you're noticing things about them. And you're not just noticing those things. Christ before my eyes, the move is adoration. So we're adoring the Lord for some way that he is, for his mercy, for his courage, for his uh, poise under pressure or so, you know what I mean? There's a number of different things. So we're adoring the Lord there. We're looking at this, not dispassionately. We're looking at this lovingly. The second move is Christ in my heart. So this is almost where we turn our gaze inward and we reflect. Am I living what I've just admired and adored in Christ or in our lady or in the saints or whatever? We turn our gaze inward and we say, well, am I courageous like that? Do I not care what other people think about me, but look at the person who is it, who God has, who God wants me to defend or protect or whatever? Am I like that? And very often the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> or something, usually you'll find you're, you're drawn, you're attracted in the first part to these attributes or features of Jesus or Mary that you yourself need to grow in, right? And you'll see why this is really good in the third part. Or in the second part, rather, in this the kind of, in this Christ in my heart, you almost make this into a prayer. So if you notice that like, oh, he is courageous and I love his courage and I love you, Lord, for your courage. I am not courageous. I am very often quite weak. And I want Lord to be a man of courage like you. Again, you can see in this, in my going through the meditation, you can see those literally that formula in there. Lord, I want to be a man of courage or of mercy or whatever, or a woman of patience or, you know, uh, you know, a great, uh, great love and intensive intensity of love. Um, make me more like you. You're taking this reflection and you're making it into a prayer now. And you're saying, Lord, I love this in you or in someone. Please make me more like that. Okay? So you can see this is the petition. The act of the will now is this petition. First is adoration, loving. Now it is petition. Lord, I want to be like that. I desire to be like that. Lord, help me. Make me like that. And then the third part, Christ, again, Christ before our eyes, Christ in our heart, now Christ in our hands. Christ in our hands is where we are practical with ourselves and we say, okay, I admire the Lord for this characteristic or attribute, this way that he is. What do I have to do in order to become more like him? How can I actually, practically speaking, foster what I adore in him? And you write down, like, very practically, like, you know, um, I need to, when I find myself wanting to garner people's approval, I need to instead focus on what would God want me to do in this situation and then do that. So that's a practical thing. Like when I'm tempted to care too much about what people think about me, think of God instead. And it's helpful to write something like this down because it, Two reasons. Number one, it holds us to accountable, but also it fosters a kind of ongoing conversation with God. You can see over time, like, boy, you know, you're taking a note, let's say in like a little journal or something. Boy, courage is coming up again and again for me. Or, you know, patience is coming up again and again for me. Like, this is something that I really want to grow in. And then over time, you'll be able to see how God actually helps you to grow. So it fosters like an ongoing conversation with God. It's not like every time you sit down to pray, it's like a new, it's like you're starting with a blank slate with God. It's an ongoing relationship that we're building with him. And then after that's the body of the meditation, that's the, the heart of it. Then you have a time of Thanksgiving. You know, you thank God for the time that you got to spend with him. Thank God for what he's shown you. 
about him and about him about yourself um, and then afterwards you go back to the remote and the the remote kind of preparation where you're trying to just to create an awareness of of god and his presence throughout your day that is one way of meditating on the scriptures i want to offer just a last couple points and then you might have some questions um the first one is don't get discouraged, right? If you can't do this every day, it's very hard to do this every day. Okay. Um, if you're not a priest or a religious sister, you've got other duties, right? God has asked of you other things. Um, do what you can. If you find yourself in this place, if this kind of resonates with you, oh, this is, I feel like this is where I'm at right now in my spiritual life. And I feel like this is really attractive to me. I would like to, I would like to do this then. Okay. Make a start. Um, and if you can only do it a couple times a week, great. Make a start with it. Right? So don't get discouraged if you can't do this every day. The second thing is kind of related. Don't get discouraged if you make plans to do it and you either do it poorly or you totally flake out and you don't do it. Right? Stand up, dust yourself off and begin again. Okay. Don't let the fact that you don't do it perfectly or that you drop the ball and you were lazy and you didn't do it. Don't let that stop you from doing it entirely. Say, ah, oh, what's the point? And you, you scrap it. Obviously that's not what God would want. That's not what God wants. That's what the devil wants to play on. He wants to discourage us. Right. And, you know, uh, knock us off the path of prayer. So don't get discouraged. Um, Second thing is, uh, let's see, uh, be generous with God. Even if you don't have those sensible consolations, right? Uh, that's not a sign that you're doing something wrong. That's a sign maybe that you're progressing. It could be anyway. A sign that you're making progress in the spiritual life. Press on. Keep going, right? Even if it doesn't feel like it did at the beginning. Go forward. Because what God is often, sometimes doing there anyway is... He's purifying you so that you love him for who he is and not what he gives you, right? So keep loving God, keep praying, even when you don't feel like it. Just a, an encouragement there. And then distractions. Who doesn't experience distractions in prayers? My goodness. All of us do. The greatest saints did. My gosh, it's just everywhere and everyone, everyone's got it, okay? So the first, there are two different kinds of distractions, Voluntary distractions and involuntary distractions. Voluntary distractions should be addressed promptly and strongly. These are venial sins. So this is where you kind of like willfully sit down and you bring the newspaper with you into adoration, right? Stop that. Don't do that, <laughs> right? Um, like it is a privilege to be in the presence of God. You want to give him your best, okay? And so don't go in basically like lackadaisical or thinking, well, I, all that matters is that I'm physically present. I can be a million miles away in my heart and mind, right? That's a voluntary distraction. And you want to be really strong with yourself about that. Involuntary distractions are where you're sitting there and you're trying to pray. You're really working on it. And my gosh, you're just being battered around the place by the craziest stuff. Your mind is wandering and you're, ugh gosh, you're trying so hard to stay focused on the Lord or on what your meditation is or something. And you find yourself just so, I don't know, like uh, out to sea, right? Uh, you're not trying to conjure these things up. They're just happening, right? So first of all, if you become aware of them or when you become aware of them, gently bring your attention back to what it is that you're doing, right? Don't get discouraged here. Don't get, don't throw in the towel or beat yourself up or sort of like really get down in yourself. That's to play into the enemy's hands, right? Gently bring your attention back. Even if you have to do that a dozen times or two dozen times during your holy hour. This, this, these are not my advice. This is the advice of the saints. Gently bring your attention back to what it is that you're doing. And if that doesn't work, right? You do that a million times. And God is still bringing your attention back to something, right? You can pause your prayer for a minute 
and bring that thing, whatever God is bringing your attention to, or whatever your attention is being drawn to, bring that to God. Maybe you're distracted by something that someone said to you and it's just bothering you. It's like niggling at you, you know, and you can't find yourself able to, to really focus on your prayer and you're trying and you're gently bringing yourself back. Okay. Bring then that thing to God, right? And ask for, uh, ask for God to help you to deal with it. Maybe to help you to come to forgive or to at least come to be detached from the thing where you're, you know, it's not preoccupying you. Another thing you can do when you're distracted is have a book handy, not just any book, a spiritual book, right? A book that can help you. Sometimes you just have to sit and actually read. Um, I think it was St. Teresa of Avila. I mean, she had times when she could not pray. She could not pray on her own without having a book with her, right? Um, and she's Teresa of Avila. Like, my gosh, like <laughs> us poor saps, like, we should feel quite all right to have a recourse to a, a good spiritual book from time to time. Uh, make sure you're well prepared for your meditation. You know, if you're come, if you go into adoration or you go into prayer and you have to pop your earbuds out to go in, well, it's going to be hard for you to get into the mode of prayer. Preparing yourself well might mean taking a little bit of time of silence, especially Give yourself time to sort of like settle down and then move into that time of like spent in communication with God who speaks again in the quiet of our hearts. Um, all that noise is, uh, can be quite, uh, can be a barrier for us hearing his voice. It's good to be try to be recollected. Okay. I think uh, that's a lot. That's a lot of that I've thrown at you. The nice thing about these recordings is that, you know, if there's something that you want to go back to, you don't have to listen to the whole thing again, but you might be able to go back and listen to just part of it. Um, if there's something that you, you feel like you missed or you want to double back on. So I open the, the floor to questions. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? Um, the easiest thing, again, might be to put it in the chat box because otherwise it can be a little bit uh, chaotic with... Uh, so many people on the call at the same time. While you're typing, just to remind you of the, so you don't get, you don't lose the forest, kind of, yeah, lose the forest for the trees or whatever. Um, the overarching project within this phase of the spiritual life, the work of God is our transformation, where we come to love God like we haven't loved him before, to love him more. And we also come to be more, become, we come to be more like him, right? So that's what's happening. We're growing in our conformity to Jesus. We're growing to become a bit more like him in the way that he is. Okay, question. Without the benefit God gives us, why would one love him? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, he. when I'm talking about the benefits that he gives us, I'm talking about the good feelings, right? So he begins to withhold the good feelings it's not like God ceases to bless us. The fact that you're breathing is reason to love God. You exist because of God. You were created out of nothing. You're created in love, purely by love. And you were redeemed by God while you were still far from him, while you still didn't love him. And you were quite you, not you personally now. All of us were quite unlovable, right? Um, why would we still, why would we love God even though we don't get the good feelings? Because God has been so good to us. The only right response and just response is to thank God and love him with all our hearts and to live for him. That's the, that's the, the main reason is first out of recognition for all that he has done for us, even though he withdraws the good feelings. And then also, again, it's not as though God ceases to bless us in other ways or we cease to benefit. Like God is the one, we're, we're the ones who benefit from our fidelity to God. Like to those who are faithful, Jesus says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it so much as dawned upon the mind of man what God has ready for those who love him. It hasn't even dawned on our minds what God has ready for us 
who love him, right? So we love God also because uh, like he does promise us eternity with him. He promises us himself forever. And that's the real treasure, not the good feeling. So he withholds the feelings. He doesn't withhold all benefits. And that's a way to purify us so that we love him again for who he is and not for just the good feelings that he gives us. Or we don't love primarily the, the good, the sort of like the fruits, the benefits, but we love him. We love him. Okay. Uh, sorry. A couple questions there. All right. Another question. I know the Ignatian spiritual exercises. Do you have any practical ways to recognize the differences between not praying as God wants us to and the dark night of the senses? Yes. That's a great question. So uh, the dark night of the senses is where, again, God is starting to withhold those good feelings, right? Uh, how is that different from desolation? Because as you guys know, desolation and consolation are like a normal part of your spiritual life. We fluctuate very frequently, like like the like a wave. You know, sometimes we have, we're in a moment of consolation, where God seems very close, and where God is sort of like carrying us along, and it's easy to pray and to live faithfully. And other times we're in a bit of a trough, we're in desolation, and it's dry and it's hard, and we don't feel like it. How do we know the difference between that normal fluctuation, or, as Sean says, when we're not praying as we should, and this? more intense dark night of the senses, right? Um, well, the spiritual writers point out uh, a few things. So, you know, if we're not praying as we ought to, um, like we should consider like, are we praying as we ought to? Um, sometimes God allows us to experience desolation because uh, in like a, in a smaller sort of episodic way, maybe we're, we're proud or we don't recognize our need for God. Or maybe because we've become, we've become lukewarm, right? Um, where the fervor that we used to have for God has kind of died off, where we've got a little bit complacent, right? If you look at, if you look at your life carefully, examine your conscience well, if you see those things, you're in desolation, so it's, it feels hard to pray, and you find that one of those two things is true, then you probably are in desolation. And what you need to do is press on and love God more intensely and pray more, not less, right? Um, if you are the dark night of the senses, this transition into the illuminative way, it's marked by a few different characteristics. Um, let me see if I can find them here rather than just sort of winging it. Oh, okay. I found it here. Very good. So, uh, one, uh, there are three signs that you're transitioning into the illuminative way you're going through the dark night of the senses, right? The first one is when those convictions in discursive prayer, the truths of our faith, who is God? Who are we? What is our, the purpose of our lives? These things that discursive prayer helps us to grow stronger in, in our minds, right? When these things are firmly held in our minds, when you have these things down, and when they're very quick to kind of come up, you know them well, right? That's one sign that you're ready to, you're, you may be moving into this uh, illuminative way and a time for effect, more effective prayer. The second sign is when we find it difficult to derive any benefit from those considerations. When you're doing discursive prayer and it's just like, it's, you're not getting a lot out of it over an extended period of time, even though you're putting in your best effort right? That's another sign that, okay, maybe it's you're being, maybe the Lord is pulling you into the more mature prayer of the will, the effective prayer, like we're describing here. And a third sign is where we're actually just drawn, are drawn more and more to that effective prayer. That would, those are three signs that you are maybe going through this dark night of the, of the senses where God is kind of a, uh, calling you into this next stage, right? Now, this is going to sound frustrating, I'm sure, to many of you, right? What's really helpful in this? A spiritual director. 
<laughs> now I know that's very frustrating to many of you because finding a spiritual director is very hard and finding a good one is very hard. I know that I look, I've had to look for spiritual directors as well. I know it's very hard to do that. So, but it is helpful because having someone outside of you who it knows you well and knows the spiritual life well, better than you do is a great asset because they can kind of help to identify like, Oh, you're just in a bit of a dry patch now keep going. Or like, Oh no, maybe it's time to look at trying a different type of prayer. Right. So anyway, uh, we try the best that we can, if we can't find a good spiritual director and you know, yourself and the church teaches this, the true ultimate spiritual director is the Holy spirit. Right. That said, it is helpful to have an extra set of eyes on us. Okay. The next stage that we're going to go into is we're going to look at the very famous dark night of the soul. All right. That transition in between the illuminative way uh, where the focus is on our, on our transformation and the unitive way where our focus is on with growing an intimate uh, union with God himself. Okay. Um, so we'll look at that now in the, in the next session and the type of prayer that's most associated with that, which is called con uh, contemplation. Now that said, contemplation is still something that is practiced by people, even in the very earliest stages of the spiritual life. So don't think that you need to be like, you know, mother Teresa, literally mother Teresa, or like St. Teresa of Avila or St. Bernard of Clairvaux to do, to benefit from, from contemplation. It's something that all Christians can can do and benefit from, okay? Um, but we'll talk about that more the next week, all right? Good. Will we finish with a prayer and then I'll give all of you a blessing? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all and know that I'm praying for you all every day. All of you guys who are part of this, uh, part of this class each week. So you're in my prayers every single day. God bless you. We'll see you next week.